All right. So before we go into multi or two dimensions, let's explain something else. So we've been doing something called linear kinematics, meaning one dimensional kinematics. We're only we're only looking at motion that moves in straight lines. We can have motion that's not in straight lines. So if you throw a baseball, or you get a baseball, so it's going to a parabola. You shoot a basketball, so it's going to a parabola. So it's moving up, and it's moving forward, and it starts moving down. So you have up and down motion, and you have horizontal motion. Before we go into actual two dimensions, let's back, or let's not backtrack, let's introduce rotations. So now let's move in circles. So, let's suppose, let's see, how is that door? So, the door is on a hinge, right? So, here's a door. So we got a door. It's on a hinge. Door to the classroom. Now, what happens if we push on a door with some force? Again, this is this is a called a pivot. The door. So we've been learning about forces. If I push on a box, it's going to move forward. When you push on that door to come in the classroom. Does the door start flying forward into the classroom? Kinda, but not exactly. It rotates. It will rotate around this point. So, when we apply a linear force, um, this door doesn't experience a linear motion. It applies a rotational motion, right? Because it's going to rotate around the pivot. So if I define this distance right here from the pivot to the force as R, so F is linear force, R is distance, From pivot to force, this door is not going to spin experience. Uh, it's not going to experience a true linear force. It's going to spin experience a rotational force. So this is a Greek letter tau. and it is equal to. R cross product F. So this is torque it can be thought of as rotational force uses Greek letter tau this is distance or radius from center uh, center of rotation The pivot point, i.e., pivot. Note, what do you think this symbol right here is?
No, but your intuition's right. It's a type of multiplication. It's called a cross product. Multiplication with vectors. So, um, let me scratch out the word distance. This is displacement. What's the difference between displacement and distance? Displacement is a vector. It has a direction. We also have linear force. Um... So, note, both R and F are vectors. Multiplication between two vectors. Is different than multiplication with scalars. Scalars are non vectors such as maps, uh, they don't have a direction. So here's our equation. But do you know how to multiply vectors? <laughs> There's actually two different ways of multiplying a vector. So this is a cross product. Mm -hmm. So this is this right here. I'm going to do the multiplication with you. So uh, we're again we're not doing 2D right now. Uh, we will in the future. But Let me redraw this and show you what this is. So if if force is perpendicular to lever the object you're rotating um then r cross product f is equal to r times f Regular multiplication. If force is parallel to lever, so what happens when you don't have a force? Things don't move. Now, if you go to that door and you push on it parallel to the edge, what rotate? So, what do you think torque is? So, torque is just like regular force, except for it's rotation. So, if you push on the door, will it rotate? That's one on, uh, on the edge. If you push on the edge, will it rotate? No. So, that means that torque 
is zero. And this will be Newton meters. Force is in Newtons, R is in meters. Hence, no torque is applied. No torque is applied. Door doesn't rotate. And then again, we're not really going to be doing two dimensions yet. But just to introduce it early to you, if you apply a force at some angle theta, you've had geometry, right? So if you have some angle theta here, only the perpendicular component of the triangle counts. So we have some distance right here, R. Uh, if force is at some angle beta, then only the perpendicular component contributes. So tau is equal to R cross product F. Um, this would correspond to tau equals R times F times sine theta. Does that make sense? So only only the perpendicular component of a force actually contributes. We're not going into two dimensions yet. So we're only going to start out with just looking at this one dimensional where the force is perpendicular. But you have to realize that if the force is parallel, no rotation is going to occur. Uh, if you do, if you type in sine of 90 degrees, uh -huh. sine of 0, I'm not drawing this wrong. Yeah, I drawn the wrong. The theta should be here. Because sine of 90 degrees, so if this angle was 90 degrees, sine is equal to 1. So sine equal to 1, we get this. That's just R times F. Sine of zero degrees, so if we reduce this, this angle down to zero, um, it's equal to zero. Sine of 180 degrees is also zero. So if I rotate this sine over here, like in this little case, it's zero. Okay. So sine, only when sine is vertical do we get the full force. Make sense? So, I like testing this. <laughs> so, we get the greatest force where we put uh, So, push directly here. How easy is it to push? Now 
now by pushing this up. Now start pushing down the hammer So we get this colony of support when we're farther away from it. So when we increase R, we get colony of support. So we start pushing closer to the center, and we're super hot. Uh, also, we get the colony of support whenever we're more particular. So I'm pushing my center, and I'm going to push right here, super, super hot. So torque, um, we can increase our rotational force by increasing our distance away from R. Um, we can all, uh, also, to get the strongest force, we want to be perfectly perpendicular. If we're at some angle, then if we're at some angle, then um, what ends up happening is we're only taking the vertical or perpendicular component. So we want to be pushing it perpendicular and bothers the what? So let's work on an example. Um, so, um, so, I will say this. Torque can be thought of as rotational force. The same, or I should say, most of all laws that apply to traditional linear force also apply to rotational force, i.e. The torque can be thought of as a rotational force. Most of all laws that apply to traditional linear force also apply to rotational force. So what is the first law of motion? So what was the first law of regular motion? So, an object not rotating stays not rotating. An object rotating stays rotating at same rotational speed unless acted upon by an unbalanced torque. So we can take our ball and 
we can take our first law of motion and create an equivalent rotational law. Another way of saying this is the sum of torques equals zero newton meters if rotation isn't changing. So if something isn't rotating, the sum of torques equals zero. If you were to go to engineering school, they use this property overall. When they're building a building, they actually pretend as if everything can rotate. And they'll actually solve the entire problem, assuming that things can rotate. Because we know that if it did rotate around a certain point, so for example, if I'm designing a bench, So we have a bench on the ground. They would remove. They'll pretend like a leg could be disappeared. We can remove a leg, which may, which would make the bench or rotate around this point. The sum of all torques around this point has to equal zero if the bench isn't rotating. So they uh, so they'll come over here and analyze it by placing a large mass sitting on it. So if someone were to sit here, it would make it want to rotate around this point right here, right? If this was not uh, bolted in, sitting right here would cause the board to bounce up. And what they do is they'll, uh, they'll, they'll measure how much force does a bolt have to support in for order for this not to rotate. And so what they'll do is they'll come in here and design. They need a bolt that can handle a thousand new meters. Uh, so that if someone sits on the very edge of the bench, the bolt won't break. So let's, uh, I keep getting ahead of myself. So torque, I mean, torque is a pseudo vector. For the purposes of this class, it's a vector. It's a pseudo vector. I keep wanting to put S. It's a pseudo vector. You can think of it like a true vector. A vector has magnitude and direction. So, if I have, let's go back and look at this door. If I apply a force right here, it's going to cause this door to want to rotate clockwise, right? There are two ways to indicate direction. So, this is F, this is R. Because it's perpendicular, the magnitude is just going to be R times F. Do not put a period, by the way. Uh, do not write it as R dot F. This is, again, called a dot product. It's a vector um, symbol. Um, we have to write them together if we want to do multiplication. But uh, one way is we call something called the right-hand rule. If we take our right hand and we wrap it around the point of rotation and curl our fingers in the direction that rotates. So we curl our fingers in the direction it rotates. 
or thumb will be pointing in the direction of the vector. So if it rotates like this, your thumb is pointing down. So the vector is pointing downward into the paper in this case. Or if I had it like this, in which case it's going down the other way, this is going to make it rotate counterclockwise. Uh, note that this is note this is still going down. Uh, this is still clockwise. So it's going to want to rotate around like this. So my thumb is pointing downward. If I instead had the force like this, it's going to make it want to rotate counterclockwise, which I usually abbreviate as CCW. So now my thumb is going to be pointing up toward the camera. Um, so we can either, can you draw good in 3D on a piece of paper? Can you draw good in three dimensions on a 2D piece of paper? I mean like real 3D, like draw an arrow coming off the piece of paper. No? So limited. You need to get one of those 3D printing pens <laughs> and turn in homework with <laughs> 3D prints out of it. We can't really draw these vectors up and down. So we can indicate direction by counterclockwise, or CW for clockwise. So whenever we come up with a value, note that on all vectors, you have to indicate direction. Uh, last time, it was more easier to just let positive be forward, negative be backward. We can ignore direction. With clockwise motion, uh, or with torque, we almost always will have clockwise and counterclockwise. Because we're we can't really draw the vector coming out of these paper. Uh, later in the year, this is known as the right hand rule. This will be used much later in the year. So again, you take your fingers uh, and you go around the center point and you rotate, curl around it like you're grabbing. It. Imagine there's a pole coming out of the, uh, out of it, and you grab that pole where your fingers going, your thumbs go point in that direction. You have to use your right hand. It's called the right hand rule. So, imagine we have a hundred Newtons here, and we have two hundred and fifty Newtons here, of course. The distance between here and here is, let's say, 2 meters. And the distance between here and here, let's call it R. My question is, how far to the left? Should the 100 Newton force be applied so that the beam doesn't rotate. So think of this like a seesaw game. You have two people sitting on a seesaw. A heavier person. Oh, um, hang on. I've drawn this really wrong. I have the forces backwards. Mm -hmm. A hundred newton person here, and a two hundred and fifty newton here. Sorry about that. How far to the left should the 250 Newton force be applied so that the beam doesn't rotate? So we have a light person sitting at the very edge, and we have a heavier person um, who's sitting closer to the middle. How far away should he sit, uh, sit 
so that the seesaw doesn't rotate. We know if there's no rotation, the sum of torques has to equal zero newton meters. By the way, a torque is measured in a unit of newton meters. So let's, uh, these forces are perpendicular. So we can use, if they're perpendicular, we can use the fact that torque is just equal to R times F. So let's do the 250. So the torque is equal to R times 250 newtons. Uh, and this would be, which way would it make it rotate? Right So counterclockwise, you could also draw the symbol like this. If you draw the symbol, make sure it's readable and understandable. I had people draw it like this. I had them try to draw a circle like that. I can't tell what direction that's going in. It looks down to me. <laughs> um, the other torque would be 2 meters times 100 newtons, which would equal 200 newton meters, and this would be clockwise, rotating like this. Now, just like when we were doing east, west, north, south, we had forward and backwards, we can't do math with directions. We have to let one direction be positive, one direction be negative, and then we'll change back our answer at the end. So I'm going to let counterclockwise. No, I'm not. I'm gonna let. Yeah, I'm gonna let counterclockwise because it contains my variable. I'm solving for that variable be positive. So my sum of torques, I call this torque 1, this torque 2. My sum of torques equals torque 1 plus torque 2 and that's equal to 0. So I'm going to be letting counterclockwise be positive. So when I plug this in, that'll be R times 250 newtons and it'll be positive. And then I'm going to add this one. So this is clockwise, so I'll let it be equal to negative 200 newton meters. And that will be equal to zero. So adding these together, that is 250 newtons minus 200 newton meters, zero. Moving this to the other side. That is R times 250 newtons equals 200 newton meters. Divide by 250 newtons to both sides. R, the newtons, so this cancels out. Newtons cancel out, and we get 0 0.8 meters. And that's our answer. So in order for these two forces to cancel, so it doesn't rotate, this person would have to stand zero, uh, sit 0 0.8 meters, and this person would have to sit 2 meters away from the center. Does that make sense? It's not too hard, it's just a new equation. Uh, once we're done with this unit, we will be coming back to this and kinematics in two dimensions. Right now, all of our forces are perpendicular. So let's do a more practical example.
So we got a house. So this is the roof, uh, building. We got a long pole. And we got a rope. On this rope is a large sign. So let's let this distance right here. So we can imagine that this being fixed and engineering this symbol right here means fixed. Just uh, slanted lines. Uh, this this pole is going to want to rotate around the point attached to the building, right? So let's let this be 1.2 meters. And the rope is attached at 1.5 meters. Let's let the sign be 50 kilograms. And the question is, what is the minimum Let me make sure this is the correct word. What is the min, uh, min, uh, mom tensile strength? Uh, what is the minimum tensile strength of rope required to hold up a sign? So we want this pole to hold up a sign, and we don't want it to break. If the rope breaks, obviously the pole is going to start rotating downward. So we can do the torque 1 of the sign. So this would be 1.2 meters. Uh, and what would be the force error? So force from sign equal to weight of sign, right? How much it weighs? F equals MA, right? So we take its mass, 50 kilograms. The acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. So the force of the sign is 50 times 9.8. So that's a 490 newton sign. So the force from the sign is 490 newtons. And it's going to make it want to rotate in this direction. Torque 2 will be equal to 1.5 meters. And it'll be times by the force of the rope, the rope force. And this is going, so the rope is going to be pulling upward, right? So the rope is pulling upward. So it's going to make it want to rotate this direction. So the sum of torques, which is T1 plus T2. Equal zero if the sign isn't rotating. So this is 
this contains my variable. So I'm going to let this direction be positive. So that means this direction would be negative. So negative 1.2 times 490 plus a positive 1.5 times F of the rope, and that equals zero. So 1.2 times 490 is 588 Newton meters. Divide by 1.5 meter. So the force of the rope has to be 392 Newton. So the rope has to be able to support 392 Newtons. What this means, and we can see better designs when we get to date. Or actually, no. Um, uh, what this means is the rope doesn't have to support the full weight of uh, the sign. The rope only has to be able to hold up less than 400 newtons, while the sign weighs about 500 newtons. So by design, by making this rope farther out than the sign, uh, it's able to lift up a heavier sign. Does that make sense? So there are design, uh, there are designs where you can actually end up using less, uh, less strong material to support up heavier objects. I think that's where we'll stop today. Any questions?